Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our text for today is actually excerpts of all three of our readings, uh, but in particular, um, uh, we're going to focus on Genesis chapter 3, and in particular, verse 15, which reads, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Let us pray. These are thy words, O Lord. Help us and sanctify us in the truth. Thy word is truth. Amen. Well, today is the first Sunday in Lent. And on the first Sunday in Lent, we always hear a gospel, one, of the gospel, one of the gospels tell us about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Um, today, it happens to be from the Gospel of Matthew. And it, what's interesting is the Old Testament reading and the Epistle reading happen to match pretty close every year, but in particular this year, it's closer than ever before. You see, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness is one of the most wonderful events in all of human history. I say that because it is a cosmic battle between God and the devil. And here in this cosmic battle, God wins the victory. You see, the cunning of Satan, who is the father of all lies, is no match for the power of God's word. And this is what Jesus came to do. This is why Jesus went into the wilderness, to fix the thing that Adam and Eve broke. Jesus does more than just simply show us how to do battle against the devil. He fights for us and he wins the victory of humanity against all the powers of darkness. You see, by Jesus obeying where we have given in to Satan's temptation, Jesus is rewriting our history. Today's reading from Genesis explains every problem that we have in this life. It explains why we do the things that we do in this life. It explains why we hurt the ones that we are supposed to love. It explains the addictions that we face today. It explains why faith is such a challenge. That is, faith to believe God's word. Not only does St. Peter remind us that the, that the devil is constantly prowling around like a roaring lion looking for those whom he may devour, St. Paul put it like this, for we, that is us, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The devil won the victory with Adam. The devil and Adam, for a while, became like this, close kissing cousins. They were friends. But notice how the devil did it. He came to Adam through his dear wife. God gave Eve to Adam to care for. And Adam owed her spiritual care. God made him to be the spiritual head. And he was to care for her as a man is supposed to care for his wife by protecting her from the word of God or for, with the word of God. Instead, he abdicated his office and submitted to her spiritual oversight 
As a result, the devil was able to gain mastery over Adam through his wife. But while Eve ate the forbidden fruit before Adam did, guess what? The Bible clearly lays the blame for this at Adam's feet. God holds Adam responsible. It is Adam's sin that is reckoned to the world. Our epistle reading for today is quite fascinating. It's fascinating because it talks about how, how through this one man, how through this one man, Adam, everyone is part of the fall. That through this one man, Adam, sin came into the world and the entire world has died and will die. We die because we are now accomplices, not just simply because we inherited Adam's sin, but because of our own sin as well. Unless we think Eve got off the hook, she's guilty too. But Adam shoulders the blame because he listened to his wife instead of to God. But there is good news in our epistle reading. For we hear this, through one man, Jesus Christ, and his perfect obedience, the many will be made righteous. You see, everything that, that Adam did wrong, the train wreck that Adam caused through his disobedience, Jesus sets right. He completely undoes through his obedience. What's very interesting, as we look at the temptation that, uh, that Adam and Eve faced with the serpent, and we compare it with the temptations that Jesus faced in the wilderness, we see a stunning similarity. And if you think about the temptations that we face today, there's a stunning similarity. You see, the temptations fall into these three categories. The first category is one of eating. Am I going to have enough? Is God going to take care of me? The second one is that we're going to be like God, that we're going to know good from evil. In other words, that we can orchestrate and do things on our own without God's help. And the third is the thought that somehow we can live forever, that we're not going to die. This first tempt, and all of these temptations have to do with our distrust or our lack of faith in God's word. For example, the first temptation is to neglect God's word. What he has promised. What was it that God said to Adam? He says, you can eat of any of the trees of the garden. All of this, everything and anything you see is there and is there for you. There was an abundance, an over an abundance. But God said, but just as one tree over there, you're to leave alone. What did God, what happened to Jesus in the wilderness? He fasted for 40 days. And after 40 days, imagine what you would be like if you hadn't eaten in 40 days. You'd probably be a little... A little hungry and so the devil comes to Jesus and says command these stones to become bread and what does Jesus say he goes seeks replies to Jesus replies to the devil with these words man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God so you see our first temptation is to neglect the word of God. The word that he has promised to care for us. He has promised to make sure that he will supply our every need. But what do we do? We look at our cupboards and we say, what am I going to eat? We look at our bank balance and we see that it's starting to drop and we start to worry. 
How are we ever going to pay the bills? I've got repairs I've got to make on the house. How am I ever going to pay for that? And we start to panic instead of relying on God's word of promise that he will take care of our need. The second temptation is to disconnect from God's word. What was it that, that, uh, that the devil said to Eve? He says, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. And so we disconnect from God's word when we uh, start to think that we don't need God, that we can figure things out on our own. The devil took, the devil took Jesus to the temple and he says, throw yourself down. He will give his angels charge over you, concerning you. And, uh, uh, and this is where we take God for granted. And the third is, is, uh, is very similar in that, uh, or not similar, but it is different, but it is all tied together in the thought that, that the devil says you're not going to die. And here... Jesus is being confronted with the thought of worshiping him and having all the power over all the world. The point of all of this is to help us see that, that uh, um, what Adam did, Christ has undone. Let me say that again. What Adam did, Christ has undone. Where Adam failed in the garden, Jesus perfectly accomplished in the wilderness. But that doesn't mean that the devil didn't try to derail Jesus from his work of salvation. He did try. He did try to get, the, to get Jesus to forget about God's word of promise. He did try to get to Jesus to forget about taking God for granted. He did try to get Jesus to think that that he could become uh, a ruler over his own world if he just bows down and follows the devil. He did try to do that, but he failed. Jesus deals with each and every one of the sins that Adam brought into the world, and he does each and every one of them in his own righteous work. Where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. It's easy to get caught up and to analyze these temptations. And there is so much in all three of these lessons that would be impossible to cover at all. But there is one passage, one verse that I want us to take away and, and hang on to. Because it is, it is one passage of gospel that we hear and the Genesis account. Genesis 3.15, you see, is the basis of the hope and the salvation and the deliverance and all the problems that you and I face in this life. It doesn't matter what's going on in our life. Genesis 3.15 is the answer. And this is what God said to the devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The last part of this verse gives us what happens on the cross. It speaks of Jesus, the seed of the woman, who is going to bruise the head of the serpent. That is, he is going to destroy the devil. He is going to crush the devil's head, some Bible translation says, while, while the devil simply bruises our Lord's heel. We know that this is describing, that this passage is describing Jesus' work upon the cross, where he shed his own blood to die for your sin and for my sin. But there is so much more to this verse, because the first part of verse 15, 15 explains the significance of the cross in a very beautiful way. The last part of verse 15 talks about what happens on the cross. 
The first part of 15 describes the significance of the cross. And this is what happened. The Lord God said to the woman, said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her offspring and your offspring. Enmity means separation. We know that this is true because we are now enemies with the devil. As Peter reminds us that he's prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for those whom he may devour. As Paul reminds us that the battles that we fight are not battles of flesh and blood, but they're battles with the principalities and powers of the, in the heavenly realms. We know that the devil is our enemy because God has created a separation between us and, him, and the devil. He was going to put enmity, separation between us. And this is because God said so, because of the word of the Lord. But what is God saying here? God is saying that this separation is going to result, be the result of what the devil has done. Because of what the devil came and did to Adam and Eve, because he deceived Eve, this is the result. This is the penalty. This is part of the curse. But there is something very beautiful behind this word, behind this word enmity. You see, when Adam and Eve were created, they were at one with the Lord. They walked with the Lord in the cool of the day in the garden. They had beautiful fellowship with God. Everything was fantastic. It could never be better. And that's why an interaction with him was such a wonderful thing. But notice what happened. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they were separated from God. They hid themselves from God. They did so because they were terrified. As a result, they were at that moment enemies of God and friends with the devil. So when God says to the devil that he is going to put enmity between the devil and Eve's offspring, and for that matter, all of her offspring, which includes you and me, God is saying that we will be separated from the devil. Which means if we're separated from the devil, that we are now reconciled with God. And that is what Jesus' death on the cross accomplishes. His death on the cross has taken away our sin. His death on the cross has crushed the head of the serpent, resulting in reconciliation with God. And when we are back together with God, when we are reconciled to God, what Adam and Eve enjoyed with God in the garden before sin, all of that has been restored. Every good thing, every blessing is now yours. It's a very beautiful verse at the very end of our Old Testament reading. After the curses are leveled, after God talks about how child, how pain is now going to be associated with childbirth, how there's going to be conflict between husbands and wives as a result of this, how, how uh, uh, suffering is going to be a part of life, how, how humanity is going to have to uh, uh, work the ground by the sweat of their brow. All of these things have taken place. We hear this at the end. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. It sounds a little insignificant, but this is the first example of God providing for humanity 
the blessings that come when we are reconciled to him. If we were still at one with the devil, we would get nothing. We would get no blessing at all. We would get no provision at all. But the fact that God gives something as simple as clothing for us to wear demonstrates how God is now providing for all our needs because the seed of the woman went to the cross and paid for our sins now enabling us to receive all good things. My friends, the temptation of Jesus is more than his personal victory over temptation. It is now our victory too. Just as surely as we inherited Adam's sin, so we also inherit Christ's righteousness. Jesus is now called the second Adam, and as the second Adam, he came to do what the first Adam failed to do. Whereas the first Adam disobeyed, the second Adam has obeyed. You see, Jesus has done what was demanded of Adam and Eve what they failed to do. They wrote a terrible history for the world that led to separation from God and death for all humanity. But Jesus, by his act of obedience, obeying God rather than giving in to the temptations of the devil, has actually created a brand new history for you and me. Because of Jesus our, and our identification with him in holy baptism, God looks at us and says, from my perspective, you did not give in to the devil's temptation. From my perspective, you have not eaten of the tree I told you not to eat of. From my perspective, you have not been unfaithful to me. You have not broken any of the commandments. From my perspective, you human beings who believe and are baptized into Christ Jesus have Jesus' own perfect obedience. And here's the good news. We no longer belong to the one who led Adam into sin. We belong to him whose obedience has undone Adam's sin. This means that we know what true glory is all about. It's hidden under the suffering of Jesus. This obedient man is our God and he is our brother. He offered his life of obedience to God as, the, as life for all of humanity. His victory over the devil and the devil's lies led him all the way to the cross where he, the seed of the woman, crushed the serpent's head and by taking away our sin, took away from the devil his power to accuse us or claim us. His obedience is our righteousness before God. And how do we know this? How do we know that, that he forgives us all our sins and empowers us to stand against the devil himself? Well, it is written. That's how we know. It is written. That's how we know. What does the Bible say? That's how we know. You see, this incarnate word defeated this father of lies with the written word. He is the valiant one, as Luther wrote in that amazing hymn, the valiant one who fights for us. And he holds the field and he gives us the victory. My friends, by Jesus obeying where we have given in to Satan's temptation, 
Jesus has finally rewritten our history. Our victory over the devil is, Jesus, is a fact and reality because of Jesus' victory over the devil. Amen? Amen. 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 And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.